Good morning. It's Wednesday, the 16th of August, and this is Govind Raj Ethi Raj, based in Mumbai, India's financial capital, and in transit, but winging back. Our top stories and themes for the day: India joins the great subsidy race. What does that mean? Food inflation is soaring away, and that means trouble. The one-year-old Akasa Airlines overtakes SpiceJet in what is an interesting turn of events in the aviation sweepstakes. And in an unexpected development, India sees record box office turnouts. This is a core report with Govind Raj Athiraj. India joins the great global subsidy race. The key reason for Tata's Jaguar Land Rover company to set up a EV or electric vehicle battery facility in the United Kingdom is obviously because that's home ground. The other reason for the Tatas to choose the UK for a 5.2 billion dollar or 4 billion pound battery or giga factory project was Spain, which apparently was an option according to the Guardian newspaper, is subsidies. The UK government has committed subsidies worth 500 million pounds or about 5000 crores now and is obviously looking forward to the jobs this project will create apart from maintaining a certain place or even a lead in the renewable space but that is not enough as britain along with other countries are engaged in a desperate battle to grab outgoing china manufacturing get a foot into the exploding renewables energy space including batteries and finally outbid the united states in bringing in manufacturing and we'll come to that in a moment Back in India, the government is in a similar global race, rolling out the red carpet with subsidies for semiconductor and mobile manufacturing to a host of other light engineering goods through productivity-linked incentives or PLI schemes. At any point of time, more industries are pitching, and the government is constantly debating whether to offer them subsidies. A recent one, for example, that's off the ground would be PLIs for pharmaceuticals and medical devices. The amounts, though, are not that large, about fifteen thousand crore rupees for this industry over six years. But there are then some areas where the amounts are jaw dropping. The Foxconn Vedanta joint venture for a roughly twenty billion dollar semiconductor project in Gujarat may have been called off, but both companies are set to come back to the table with their own projects and possibly with different partners. Now, the subsidy for this project, using the same numbers because this was on the table, can go up to seventy percent, of which fifty percent is from the central government and another ten to twenty percent from the state government. Which means, hold your breath. Over ten billion dollars or eight thousand crore rupees for a private project, likely foreign, paid for by taxpayers like you and me. At one level, this sounds utterly scandalous, but there are two contexts which may change your mind. First, as I alluded to a little earlier, is that there is a massive global race on to grab manufacturing projects that are moving out of China or manufacturers who are moving their bases out of China. Now it does appear that a country like India, which is also one of the biggest domestic markets in the world, has no choice but to stay in the race, even if it means it has to take bets of a size that would make the most adventurous Silicon Valley venture capitalists watch with wide eyes. Second, of course, is that in areas like semiconductors and batteries, being the fuels of the future, so to speak, there is strategic importance or imperative to have domestic manufacturing, or put differently, to manage supply chain anxiety. Given both these cases, staying out of the race for whatever reason would reflect worse than losing after staying in it. Either way, the choice is limited. It's a catch-22 of sorts, and time is running out. Back in the international arena, the Wall Street Journal reports that Intel has been offered 11 billion dollars in subsidies from the German government to build two semiconductor plants in what Prime Minister Olaf Scholz calls the largest foreign direct investment in German history. By the way, as the Wall Street Journal says, this pledged government financing is substantially more than the annual budget of Singapore's Ministry of Trade and Industry. The United States, by the way, is offering three hundred and seventy billion dollars or so in incentives and funding for just its clean energy initiatives as part of its Inflation Reduction Act or IRA. No wonder there's a massive flow of foreign investment. German car maker BMW is setting up a new battery plant in South Carolina. Korean firms Hyundai and LG have announced a 4.3 billion dollar again battery plant in Georgia. Panasonic of Japan is building a plant in Kansas, and there are many more, including Taiwan's TSMC. 
By the way, in climate alone, there is some $1 trillion of federal subsidies floating around in the United States and is galvanizing massive investment and projects across the country. And it's not surprising, perhaps, that the United States saw about 22% of global foreign direct investment last year, making it the world's top recipient, the Wall Street Journal says, quoting United Nations data. Now, that is slightly lower than the 26% it received in 21, when global investment bounced back after the pandemic, but significantly higher than the 13% it got in 2019. Back in India, Bloomberg has added up Foxconn's investments in India to say that it has now nine campuses across the equivalent of 500 football fields, operating more than 30 factories, with revenues already running around $10 billion annually. Now, in the case of Foxconn, it's as much of a pull as a push. Foxconn is running for the exit gate in China like the house is on fire. But the thing to remember is that while Foxconn is surely investing in India and expanding, it's also equally scouting other markets, matching manufacturing competitiveness for exports like Vietnam versus local market size to optimize its investment. As Bloomberg says, India will not replace China as the center of global electronics manufacturing. Actually, no one will. Vietnam, Mexico, Brazil, Thailand, and even the Czech Republic could all lay claim to being a future production hub, with each offering their own mix of cheap and abundant labor, infrastructure, proximity to end markets, and logistical advantages. So that obviously brings us back to India and the various investments that India is scouting for with incentives. To end on some interesting news, for some, Foxconn is now believed to be starting production of Apple's AirPods by the end of the year in Hyderabad, if no one else, this will surely mean music to the ears of Apple disciples. Meanwhile, India's exports are slowing further. India's exports fell 16% year-on-year in July to about $32 billion on slowing demand from major trading economies. Now, this in itself should not be surprising given that Chinese exports have been falling steadily as we've been reporting here and that the global environment for trade is visibly weakening. China's overseas shipments dropped about 15% in dollar terms last month from a year earlier, the worst decline since February 2020. Back home, the government of India says India's trade performance after seeing high growth in 22-23 has continued to show declining trends in July compared to a high base of last year in the backdrop for global slowdown. Exports now from India have contracted for the eighth month in a row from December 22. How Vegetables and Tomatoes Are Making Our Lives Difficult We did see it coming, though the absolute number in cold print is a shock, or even a bigger shock. India's consumer price inflation, or CPI inflation, jumped 7.4% in July 2023, as compared to 4.8% in June 2023. This is now a 15-month high. By the way, a Reuters poll of 53 economists had estimated this inflation figure to go up to 6.4% on an annual basis, knowing that food prices were surging. Evidently, despite all of that, the knowledge that is, they were off and by quite a bit. So what caused this jump? Well, first, food inflation accounts for nearly half the inflation basket. And the big driver is a growth in inflation rate of vegetables from less than 1% in June 23 to almost 37% in July 23. Cereals have gone from 12.7 to about 13% and pulses have gone from about 10.5 to 13.2. So this includes, as you would know, all your rice, wheat and dals, all of which are staple food for Indian houses. Overall food price inflation has gone from 4.5% to 11.5% in July 23. Right now, it does not appear that this could trigger an interest rate hike as there is not much connection between interest rates and food inflation of the likes we're seeing right now. A new airline takes the wicket, even as others return to pavilion. In aviation news, the year-old Akasa Air with about 20 aircraft has widened its gap with SpiceJet in July in terms of domestic passengers flown per month. SpiceJet, just to remind you, is older and has over 90 aircraft to its name. Obviously, most of these aircraft are not flying and for various reasons that we'll come to. Go Air, the other mid-sized airline one could compare Akasa with and had about 59 aircraft, is grounded since May after it filed for bankruptcy. Are there any lessons in this from the past and for the future? Let's look at some numbers first. Reports quoting government data say Akasa carried about 618,000 domestic passengers in June and 624,000 in July in comparison to SpiceJet which transported 555,000 in June 
which is obviously less. Now, SpiceJet in its present form was launched in 2005. Not that vintage makes much of a difference in a brutally competitive market and seems to work more against an enterprise than for it. Back to Akasa, its share of the domestic passenger market climbed to about 5.2% in July from 4.9% in June. Meanwhile, SpiceJet's domestic passenger market share dipped to 4.2% in July from 4.4% in June. Other airlines like Indigo and Air India are holding strong, backed by strong finances either of their own, that's Indigo, or parent companies, that's Air India. To come back to Akasa, it's gaining market share from both these airlines, one struggling and the other grounded. It has obviously challenges in the future, which is to attract talent and retain it. But in a very broad sense, what does this tell us about the past and future of India's domestic aviation industry, at least at this point? To understand that better, I'm joined by a well-known aviation writer and consulting editor to the court, Anjali Bhargava. Akasa has actually set a pretty good pace of growth. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it has set the best pace. I mean, we know they've got 20 aircraft within their first year, which is quite remarkable because none of the players in the Indian space and even globally, I'm not sure how many players manage to induct this kind of fleet and absorb it. And the other thing is that they have done this in a very smart manner by not spreading themselves too thin. They're flying to only 16 destinations with these 20 aircraft. In the past, there have been airlines in India who have flown to almost 15, 16 destinations with just four or five aircraft. They've done it intelligently. They've done it well and they're providing a very good, efficient service. It's only anecdotal. I haven't yet flown, but from everybody I speak to, I'm getting very positive feedback on their timings, the cleanliness of aircraft, handling both on the ground and in the air. So all in all, pretty good. I mean, they're doing a good job. But having said that, it doesn't give us any indications of long term because remember, it's very early days. It's just been a year. And aviation really, at the end of it, airlines have to prove both their resilience you know, in very difficult circumstances over a long period of time to for us to say that, yes, we have something with us that's going to stay. Right. And with both Go Air and SpiceJet, now these are obviously different cases in a way, but the common cause seems to be financial. Does that suggest that, you know, after a certain point of time, as years pass, as you just mentioned yourself, things become far more precarious and the best years are really the early years? I don't think so. I think a lot of spice jets problems at least are related to the pandemic. The pandemic affected, remember, not just the airlines, but everybody in the ecosystem. So your manufacturers, your engine manufacturers, your lessors, everybody has been affected. And SpiceJet has paid the price for some of the problems that Boeing has had. Therefore, I think the problems they're having today are really almost... I would say 60-70% external. And I would say that, in fact, Ajay Singh has done a remarkable job of trying to keep it going in these circumstances. Perhaps any founder or CEO with less commitment may have at some point, you know, thrown up his hands and said, enough. So that's about these two airlines. Now, in the same circumstances, an airline like Indigo has, of course, done very well. And that also has changed the skew of the market. There are two dominant players and there is a set of small players, including Akasa, who we started with. So where does that leave us? This leaves us, and I mean, it does worry me because I don't know, let me go back in history. I think the only time we really had a kind of duopoly was when we had only Air India and Indian Airlines and they were government owned. And this is, I'm talking of a period before you know, Jet Airways and all the other small players, Amodi Loaf, Damania, East West came onto the thing before the government privatized and allowed the private players in. And I don't know if you remember, but I remember very clearly that, I mean, very few people could afford to fly at that time. You and I and a large number of people probably wouldn't be able to fly. So yes, a duopoly kind of a situation developing in today's scenario in India is a bit scary. Because, you know, we don't want to go back to an era where flying becomes unaffordable. Yet, I don't see that happening. I don't think anybody would allow it, whether it's the Indian public or the government or, you know, anybody vested. So it would be nice to have one or two smaller players who run a lean and a tight ship, who sort of bring some semblance 
and don't let the biggies become too big and have too much muscle power. That would be, that would be the ideal situation. Anjali, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you. India's box offices land a surprise. Like the stock markets, the Indian cinema exhibition industry has surprised. Notably at a time, obituaries of it were being written all over the world. Cinema halls are reported to have brought in about 390 crore rupees in combined gross box office collections between August 11th and 13th, making it the busiest single weekend for the industry post-pandemic and likely in the industry's history. Some 21 million people apparently flocked to the movies, said trade bodies, again apparently a record in the last decade. The films were all homegrown, unlike earlier weekends last month where Hollywood ruled the roost. The box office collections were driven largely by films like Rajni Khan's Jailer, Sunny Deol's Gadar 2, Akshay Kumar and Pankaj Tripathi's OMG 2, and Chiranjeevi's Bola Shankar. Jailer and Gadar 2 alone took in around 280 crore rupees in this period. Incidentally, this was not predicted, at least at these levels, and the industry in general was gearing up for a long slump after the three Hollywood hits Mission Impossible, Oppenheimer and Barbie receded from the movie halls. So what's changed? Multiplex Association of India President Kamal Gyanchandani told the Economic Times that the long weekend, coupled with some aggressive push by the studios in marketing, has played a key role in increasing footfalls. The cinema exhibition industry has benefited greatly in the last three days. Multiplexes and single screens have operated at 70% occupancy in the last few days, irrespective of which part of the country they are situated in, Gyan Chandani told the Economic Times. He also expressed confidence that the after-effects of the pandemic are over and admissions would grow further as filmmakers have lined up an aggressive content slate for the second half of the year. Elsewhere, Ajay Bijli, the chief of multiplex chain PVR Inox, said they were seeing month-on-month increase in collections and also added that the performance of Hindi films in the context of volatility has reduced. Now, this, of course, is just the Independence Day weekend, and I will pick up on this in a few days to see what trends sustained or not. Meanwhile, at least for now, it's a happy ending to the story. That's it from me for today. Have a great week ahead, and I hope you had a wonderful Independence Day. Thanks for listening. This was the core report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at the core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in. Or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening. <laughs>